بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Peace and love everybody, I'm Brother Ali, this is the Traveler's Podcast You probably know that because you're watching or hearing this because you click something that said Traveler's Podcast with Brother Ali um, I've been blessed to live a really interesting life with different communities and different roads that don't always converge in one life And because of that I have met a lot of really incredible people along the way, and those are the people that are on this podcast. So I've been, um, you know, I'm a convert to Islam. I'm an albino. I was an imam for a while when I was a teenager. <laughs> I was an activist, organizer. I'm also an independent hip hop artist. And in all of those things, I've been blessed to do them officially. Like I've been able to be official, uh, like a ref with a whistle in every one of these issues. And so I've met incredible people along the way that have been my friends, teachers, mentors, comrades, companions, you know, and they've all shaped who I am. And some of them, that's, those are the people that are on this show, and some of them uh, actually become household names. Dr. Cornell West is one of my friends, teachers, mentors. He was the first guest on this podcast. He's on one of my albums. I was on his podcast back in the day. And um, he's running for president, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, Ilhan Omar is the first Muslim American Congress lady. And Chuck D is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And Hassan Minhaj uh, is big enough for the New York Times to try to destroy his career. It's, it's like, you know, these are people that have reached the highest heights of the field that they're in. Uh, but there are a lot of people that you meet along the way that... If history tells the story accurately and completely, there are people whose names, it'll probably be historic that they become recognized for the contributions that they've actually are making. And most of the people that are on this show are that way. So, I mean, people love Eminem, and I'm not mad at Eminem at all. I'm a lot of respect for Eminem. But when I hear people talk about Eminem, the things they're saying are true to me of Pharaoh Monch. And Farrell Munch was one of the early guests on this podcast as well. So there are a lot of people that are doing things that are completely groundbreaking. And it's also true that a lot of times when somebody becomes famous for doing something, there's usually somebody less famous that came before them. You know what I'm saying? And then the people who, who get famous for it, they have the choice to either uh share you know the person that came before them that inspired them and a lot of times paved the way for them or a lot of times they keep it secret and i know something about that as well but the guest that we have today is really really important and really special and really profound uh her name is angelica lindsay ali but we all call her in our community the village auntie and uh, she's a professional sexual health advocate and educator um, and in the Muslim community, particularly, she's doing something incredibly groundbreaking, which is to not only educate um, on womanhood and sexual health, um, but also to create culture around it, also to create something of a sorority around her foundational womanhood classes and cohorts where she's building culture around this stuff. And that is, that's one of the things that's so historical about it. And that's why I think that it's, it, this is a really interesting, amazing guest that'll be really profound. Just also to just get a vibe for who she is, just because she's a dope human being. There are certain people that just, you just get a small dose of who they are. And it's like, man, this person is like a tree that grew from the ground. This person is like a star in the sky. Like this is, this is somebody that it's very obvious to see that the creator just crafted them in a way that's beautiful, instructional, healing. Uh, for all of us, you know, affirming for all of us. And so Village Auntie, Sister Angelica is somebody that I'm so happy to be able to share space with, to be in community with, to be her brother, to be her contemporary, to, but then also to be able to, to share her with you who don't know her yet. Um, one of the things that she's done that's so profound, like I said, is to be able to create culture around uh, sexual health, around womanhood. And it's interesting because, you know, I, my wife is a, a therapist and we, we advertise therapy on this show. We talk a lot about, about therapy on this show. And in traditional communities, whether they're religious or ethnically traditional, there are certain roles that didn't exist that people are a little bit 
weary of, leery of, weary and leery. Uh, and I understand because of the fact that when life was more natural, meaning that people weren't so hyper individualistic, when we didn't only have, like most people are so isolated in modern times. And that wasn't the way that most of humanity did life. The overwhelming majority consensus of human beings about the best way to live life is to live in relationships, in families, in extended families, in tribes, in villages, in communal life where you know nuclear families weren't so weren't so separate from everybody else like normally you would live in like a compound or a village and you would have all these different family members your grandmother would be around your your elders would be around and everybody shared life together and so in times like that the idea of having one person whose job it is to be your therapist was unheard of because of the fact that there are certain things that when community is practiced in a holistic and natural and human way, these are things that the kind of life force of the community do. You don't have to pay somebody to sit there and talk to them about your issues or your problems because of the fact that life is shared. And there are so many people with different experiences that are all, we're all witnessing each other and we're all experiencing each other. And we're just sharing the, the realities of our lives together. This idea of like generational trauma and things like that, like there would be people in a real village or in a real community, there would be people who, even if I don't know what happened to my parents, they do. And my grandparents and things like that, there are people that would know and understand that. And maybe other people that it happened to their grandparents as well. And there, there would be um, a much more natural, holistic approach to life that wouldn't require that specific role of therapist. And so for people who come from more traditional cultures, a lot of times it, there, there's, there's this um, kind of um, um, breakdown in communication of like, well, why would I go tell some stranger about all of my trauma and my pain and things like that? Does that mean something is deeply wrong with me? No, but it means that what it does mean is that we're human beings that do need to process these things together. And so when we don't have our villages and our extended families living in space with us, not just on FaceTime, but living in space and time together, it that becomes a role that is needed because of the situation, because of the deficit that we have in communal life. And what the village auntie does, what Sister Angelica does, is that role as well. So there's become a need because of the the really kind of deficiency that we have in communal life, uh, there's become this need to really be intentional about that and to build structure around it and to build culture around it. And the way that she does it is so incredible. So I'm going to shut up and, and get to that. But just so you know, off top, go follow her at Village Auntie. Uh, her classes are open to, to you know women from all backgrounds and all traditions, the foundational womanhood classes. It's really incredible, really amazing stuff. And so we're so grateful to have her here. And I can't wait for you to experience her. We uh, f Let me mention... I'm going on tour starting in about a week. I leave in just a few days. I don't want to leave Istanbul. I don't want to leave my family. I don't want to leave my daughters. I do, however, uh, want to make money so that my family can live. But I really, I always love the fact to be, uh, just the idea of being in space with people, performing the music that I've been making for the last 20 years with people who love it, listen to it, tattoo it on them you know, sing it along with me. And I'm going to be out with Living Legends, which is one of the great, great, great uh, groups, you know, of my cohort of independent artists that came along in the mid, late 90s, early 2000s, and is still going strong. They have a new album that just dropped, and I'm blessed to be on it. I have new music coming as well. So go to brotherali.com. You'll be able to see that whole tour. I'm also doing some New Year's shows with Grouch and Eli from Living Legends in Colorado. And then the first weekend in January, I'm performing with Atmosphere and Sa Rock and Soul Messiah and RJD2 and some other dope people in Florida at something called the Rise Up Concert Series. Go to brotherali.com in the event section. You can check out all of that. We're brought to you as always by the Zakat Foundation, Z-A-K-A-T Foundation. 
is a global humanitarian organization that helps people wherever people need help. It's Muslim led, but they don't use their work to proselytize. They don't only help Muslims. They're not trying to convert people. It's just an honor to help. They work with people on the ground, so it's super dope. Go to Zakat US on social media or zakat.org, Z-A-K-A-T.org to check out the amazing work that they do. We're also brought to you by The Caravan, like the subscribers, the supporters that really make this thing happen. You can get down with that on brotherali.com in the join section. But I'm really, really very, very grateful, very honored, very happy to be talking to our sister, Angelica Lindsay Ali, AKA The Village Auntie. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. <laughs> not, not village auntie on our podcast, what? It's like, it's a big day. It's a big really day grateful. for me too. <laughs> MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Um, man, it's like, where to start, you know? I think one of the things that I'm most curious about is, I have a concept of the work that you do, mm -hmm. just from following it and from learning about what you do and uh, from learning from you as a teacher and somebody that benefits from you as well. And then also the community that you're building around the work that you do. But I would like to hear, how do you describe the work that you do? And I know you work in a lot of different capacities, but as Village Auntie, how do you describe that role? Wow, that that is that is something that is constantly evolving, and I've really been sitting with it lately. So I I am a public health professional. I've been working in public health for 22 years now, and I am a certified sexual and reproductive health educator. So I teach women and men, by extension, how to harness the power of their bodies through holistic anatomy, um, censoring pleasure. But I do it through a lens of spirituality, where I see sexuality as an extension of a spiritual experience. All of that, however, is rooted in a decolonial praxis that seeks to place human beings in full control of their bodies and their minds. So the sex and intimacy conversation is just the bait to get people in the door. Okay. And then we have this conversation about how to truly not just free your body, but free your mind. Uh -huh. So, I mean, P-Funk had the song, Free Your Mind and Your Behind Will Follow. So your thing is like this, free the behind and then the the soul will follow the whole other. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> like wh wh wherever we start, the freedom journey is going to be where we start. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful thing. You know, it's interesting that um, one of the things about the Islamic tradition is that it's, I've always understood it to be, I didn't know the phrase sex positive, but once I learned that phrase, I was like, the religion of Islam is a very like like healthy, beautiful sensuality, sexuality is really celebrated in the religion. And at the same time, there it like its crown virtue is modesty mm -hmm. and the, and a certain sense of like not everything is for everyone but when something is for someone then that thing is to be completely celebrated and to be uh to be uplifted um and so i just wonder like how do you how do you understand that balance within the tradition yeah, I think it's so beautiful because actually the science of erotology, which is the study of sort of the erotic self and physical intimacy, started with Muslims. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that and mm -hmm. don't understand that. And sexuality and sex specifically within Islam is an act of worship within a, when it's within the confines of a halal relationship. And I see sexuality and modesty having this beautiful interplay because one of the reasons why we have restrictions around who we engage in sex with and how we engage in sex is because it is so powerful. Yeah. It's not because it's bad. It's not because it's wrong, but it is so powerful. It's like having a lightsaber out. You can't just like swing that thing anywhere. You can't use it as a pointer, right? <laughs> sex is the same thing, right? Right. Um, you, can't, you can't have your other lightsaber be just a pointer either. Right? That's right. That's true. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is true. So that's that's how I see the, the balance and the nuance. And when I get people who try to challenge me on being a visibly uh, Muslim woman talking about sex, I say this is a part of our tradition. 
And this is a, this is something that people of faith should be talking about because it's not sex is not bad. It's just woefully misunderstood, and it a lot of people look to sex for a spiritual experience. Mm-hmm. A lot of times when they're going to sex, what people are looking for is a spiritual experience. Absolutely. So the the modesty piece comes in it. It sort of gives you. It's like if you have a water, right? Water has to be channeled, right? There are dams, there are places so that you can get the full benefit of the water. That's what I see with modesty in Islam, especially when it comes to sexuality. You just think about with the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, telling the men that he was with that you're blessed when you make love with your wives. Mm-hmm. And they said, Messenger of Allah, we were going to do that anyway. <laughs> You know, and he said, but the but the reality that you're you know that you're that you're engaging in this particular way, is uh, is what makes it so beautiful. There's a uh, one of our imams in the Bay Area, Imam Fahim Shuaib, mm. who in the '90s was you know somebody who was really very very close with Imam Warthi Muhammad, and that's a community that I converted in, and I was I still consider myself a part of that community, mm-hmm. and. He spoke to us a lot, especially as young men, about what it meant to be men and about sexuality. And one of the things that he said is that, you know, one of the the biggest vices or the, um, you know, what they call like the cardinal sins in the Christian tradition is lust. And he said, it's not the pleasure and the joy of lust. It's the that lust is counterfeit love. Like love, like lust is the action of just seeing somebody as a as a means, you know what I mean? Rather than an end, like rather than somebody to really fully be embraced. And one of the things that I think about a lot is the idea that if you just think about, like all of our societies and civilizations come from traditions that have messaging around these basic things about what a human being is. And specifically with sex, I think traditionally, you know, about uh, so much of the European Christian tradition that says that our bodies and the world are inherently fallen and evil and bad and sex is almost like a necessary evil that like the priestly class won't do it but the lay people have to because that's the only way we're going to get people so there's got like all right you know it's a necessary evil and then i feel like in the in the psyche it's almost like well if sex is evil but sex is obviously so powerful then the more uh then the the more mm, the more unnatural it is the more exciting it becomes. You know what I mean? It almost like breeds like unhealthy engagement with sexuality. And it's one of the things that I think about the Islamic tradition that is so healing, like one of the many things that's so like natural and humanizing and healing. What, do you, what are the things that you find specifically about, uh, about the Islamic tradition and the way, that it, the way that it encourages people to engage? Yeah, you know, and I have to say, you, you shouted out Imam Fahim Shuaib. He's one of my favorite imams, and oh, man. Um, and I've never I had it. Known. Yeah, <laughs> I never... named my son after him. Oh, mashallah, mashallah. I love him to death. He's. Yeah. I've never had a chance to meet him, but we're going to be doing a workshop together in December. In Philly, Ooh, that's gonna be powerful. Yeah. <laughs> that's gonna be powerful. That, yeah, that's yeah. Bad. it. Should be a pay for pay per view on that joint. Inshallah. and I, I just love, I love his work. You know, the thing I love about Islam when it comes to sexuality is the centering of women's pleasure, and it goes against everything that people believe about Muslim women. But the way a woman's pleasure is truly centered in Islam, yeah. I, I believe that's why we have so many Islamic spaces where people are like, oh, you know, Sister Angelica, we can't invite you to the masjid. Like the brothers sometimes are shook because if you really look at the fiqh, if you look at the ahadith, if yes. you look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his advice to his companions and his advice to the, to the people, women are centered. And yes. I love that so much. And it's yes. not centered to a fault. It's not a selfish centering. It is a true acknowledgement and an upliftment of the complexity of a woman's body. You know, do not go into your wife, you know, harsh, you know, without sending emissaries, kisses and sweet words. I mean, I, I always tell sisters, if you want a romance story, read about the the, the wives of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa how he was with them. You know, just the small things. I love that Islam 
focuses so much on the importance of intimacy, not just sex, but, you know, mm. are you are you drinking from the same cup that your wife drank from and you're finding the place where she put her lips? You know, when she's on her menstrual cycle, are you laying your head in her lap as she strokes your head? These are these are real life accounts from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I love that. And that's one of the reasons why I push so hard because I get really religious sisters. The biggest detractors that I have ever had have never been brothers. They have always been sisters. There's why almost am I not surprised. It, it's it's crazy. And it's like they're so uncomfortable because I always say we don't like our women free. We don't like our women free. We don't like our women educated. We don't like our women liberated within an Islamic lens. And it's the, the liberation doesn't come from what I say. When people challenge me, I take them to the book. This is what the fiqh says. Yes. This is what the hadith says. This is what the Quran says. So that that is what I love the most. And 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 in addition to you know those two things, I love the emphasis on family and connectedness. I love that there is a dua that a man can make before he is intimate with his wife. And the dua is asking that if any children were to come from this union, please make them righteous and on the path. Like what, what more can you ask for? What can, more can you ask for? Yeah. It's amazing how, how normal, like you, you mentioned fiqh and I mean, yeah, I've come across things in studying. And when we talk about fiqh for people that are that aren't Muslim, it's like there's this big, like, scary word, like Sharia law, Sharia law. <laughs> and it's funny because every like, they say it's so weird. They do like Sharia law. Like, what is that? Oh, you mean the Sharia? Right. But I also think sometimes, and this is like fitting for this conversation, but the way they say it reminds me of my Sharia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, Shari- Sharia law, <laughs> and like you, you have no idea what Shadi uh, really is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it, it basically, and when we study it, you know, uh, one of the things that I've seen in studying the rights of women in marriage is like women have so many rights and women start out like that's the default for women to have so many rights and then if the husband is able to fulfill those things then it's an obligation to do if he can't fulfill them then it's always a work of like how do i get to the point where i can fulfill these rights Mm -hmm. and one of the rights that i've come across is that women have the right to climax yeah, like that's a right that women have in yep. in in marriage, you know. And Malachi and, Fick is up to yes, up ma'am. to three times a day hey, to her hey, to, to her specification, and I'm Malachi, so. <laughs> and and you, and you know it's funny. My wife came home, so I'm, we we live in Turkey because of my wife, and my wife is a therapist, Mashallah. and uh, she came here for Rihla. And she came back and she said, someday we're going to live in Istanbul. This is almost ten years ago. She said, someday we're going to live in Istanbul, and we're Malachi. <laughs> And since then we've been Malachi. And what I found out, I was like, I said, is this a, does this have anything to do with the- <laughs> She's a smart woman. You married a smart woman. Mashallah, man. Love bless her. <laughs> I mean, y'all don't be lying to me. Our 20th anniversary was yesterday. Yes, man. Love bless your union. It's so, it's so powerful to see people in our generation who have sustaining, long-lasting marriages. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect it and bless you both. Seeing your comment in there, I was like, "Oh man, that's it's major." Like for you to stamp the the comment section was a big deal. <laughs> uh, one of the sisters said, um, "She said, may Allah bless." It was another Muslim woman. She said, "May Allah bless durable marriages." Mm. And I said, "Man, you said a lot with the word mm. durable because that's really what it is. I mean, there's there are challenges all the time." Mm-hmm. You know, and the longer we're with somebody, the more we start to realize, we start to learn about ourselves Mm -hmm. and each other and just all of the traumas that we've been through and all the things that are, you know, that that we've experienced. It's an amazing thing. But in studying in studying the Sharia, one of the things that we come across, and it just becomes so normal to be with people in a group setting and to know who's fasting and who's not, because the, the women are on their cycle. And I, I feel like in the West, or like for a lot of people, like that would be a big secret, or people would might be really embarrassed. And it's just a, such a naturally understood thing that uh, you know that that this is a this is something that happens in life. And I, I I notice it with the way that you speak and the way that you talk. I don't know how you talk inside your like women's only classes, and that's none of my business. <laughs> but I know what I see because <laughs> I try to every time I see that you're live, I'm like, oh man, I I gotta go in the other room and and, and watch it. <laughs> 
do you so when you're having these conversations um about sexuality mm -hmm. in mixed company so in like public spaces or in like a public you know live or something like that do you have uh your own guidelines for how to be able to speak you know about things mm -hmm. and really explore them and dig into them while also still maintaining a type of uh modesty Yes, you do it. You do it excellently. Oh, like I can't yeah. believe how artistically and how beautifully and how excellent how excellent you are with that. Alhamdulillah. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a professional, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't don't uh, when they first engage with me. They're just like, "What is this lady talking about?" And I've you know I've had people say, "Oh, you're you're very well spoken." But I've been doing this work for like twenty plus years. I'm also trained in oratory from a very young age. I did like oratorical contest. So I'm, I'm, you know, I have, I'm from Detroit too. So, you know, Detroit has just got a gift of gab. Like we can, we can put things in a certain context, but my guideline is this. I don't say anything that I would not be comfortable with my mama and my Sheikh hearing. If Sheikh Mahi is watching, I, I want to make sure that whatever I say, if he hears me, he's not going to be offended. My mom, she's a clinical psychologist. She's a church secretary. I don't say anything that would offend her. Uh, and what I find is that there's by normalizing conversations about sex, it makes it much easier for me to have these conversations. And I always, if you notice when I do Instagram lives, I always try to give people some bit of like clinical or scientific backing or religious backing, especially for what I'm saying. So if you want to challenge me when I say sex is an act of worship, I'm going to say, well, you're challenging your dean, right? If you want to challenge me when I'm talking about men's erectile dysfunction or vaginismus and I give you some science behind it, it's like, okay, well, you're arguing with the research. So I, and I also know that I have two older children. My oldest son is 18. My oldest daughter is 15. They watch me, their friends watch me. And I think, how would I want someone to talk around my children? And that's how I speak. Um, so yeah, and I think it's I think it's important. I also do a lot of parenting in real life on Instagram. So like the whole thing with menstruation, when my daughter started her cycle, and she's given me permission to talk about this publicly, I ask for consent for my children also. I taught her brothers how to care for her when she's not praying. I had to explain to my youngest son, like, why is y'all be not fasting today? And I had to explain to him in a way that he can understand that her body is, is surrendering to the worship of Allah right now, and she is not able to fast. She doesn't have to fast because her body is already in a state of worship. And when she's like this, make sure you're very nice to her. Bring her warm towels. You know, if you want to rub her feet because he's a very touchy-feely boy, you can. I say, make sure she has her favorite snacks. So now, you know, when it's that time of the month, sometimes I know because my son comes downstairs and he says, Mommy, Yabi needs dark chocolate and hot Cheetos. And I'm like, okay, it must, it must be that time. <laughs> but then that's also modeling for my eight-year-old son, inshallah, bismillah, when he becomes a husband, when he becomes a father, is teaching him how to prioritize care, not shame when the women in his life experience this. My 18-year-old son, he has no problem going into the store and you know getting things for his sister. And that that's important to me. Their father is like that. But it's a part of normalizing that conversation um, around sex. And because I'm so deeply rooted in a Senegalese American Muslim community, you know, in West Africa, these things are talked about a lot more naturally. So I, I find that that having conversations about it doesn't feel as like titillating as most people might approach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. You mentioned Sheikh Mahi. Like some of my favorite people on earth are students of of uh, Sheikh Mahi Sise. Yeah, really, it, it's favorite. amazingly beautiful. <laughs> That's really very important, especially as we in, like engage the Islamic tradition, especially those of us that come from African American Muslim communities. There's something about the fact that we were welcomed into this religion, like something about learning from Imam Fahim Shu'aib. There were things that I could take from him and understand from him because of the language he used. Just the fact that he's cool mm -hmm. and he's funny. And I, like I know that he understands all of the things that you know me and my friends were going through and everything, it really meant a lot. Uh, and Sheikh Mahi also is somebody that uh, is, I think it's really important, especially for people to be able to to get our messages from people that we identify with. What's it mean specifically for you to do this work as a black woman? Oh, it means everything. I love being black. I love being black. I love being um, 
I, I call myself a plain old black girl from Detroit. I don't need to put on any airs or any affect. I, you know, I am the I'm the cool auntie who will sit and play a game of spades with you and, and and serve you up some macaroni and cheese and also make sure that you know you 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 prayed Isha, right? I think as a black woman to do the work that I do with with as much um you know, I've gotten death threats, I've gotten rape threats, I've gotten all kinds of threats. And a lot of it has to do with my blackness, but it is also because I am a black woman that I can stand in the face of people who would try to silence and oppress me. I also represent a a community of people globally who have been hypersexualized. You know, yeah. black women's bodies have been used as tools of uh, seen as only tools of of fetish or production. So for me to take a principled stance and a stance uh, as an educator, it means everything to me because then I get to shift that narrative. I get to shift the narrative about what it means to be a Muslim woman, but also what it means to be a black woman and standing on my blackness. And what I found is. You know, someone was like, oh, Sister Angelica, you know, I would love to take your class, but I'm not black. I was like, listen, you ain't got to be black to rock with me. I have students from all walks of life. And because I stand unapologetically in my space as a black woman, that means anybody can come exactly as they are. They don't, you don't have to put on anything. You know this, you've been in African-American messages. This, you know, it's always, you know, all different kinds of people who come into our spaces because we stand up as who we are. It gives people permission to be who they are. And that's, that's what I love love about the way that I have been able to create a community is that the same way you see me online, that's the same way I am offline. Like, mm-hmm. I don't have a brand in that sense. That's just me. That's, right. It's a name, but that's just me. That's how I am. Yeah. It's interesting. Like, I've been really blessed and fortunate to help a lot of people into their, like, journey to Islam, like, convert and explore Islam and things like that. And so, I, and a lot of them are are not Black. Like, a lot of them are white and um so people are always like, yeah, I, 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 you know, I love Islam. And so we'll start talking and they'll be like, yeah, I want to be a Muslim. And so I'll set up a Shahada ceremony for them. And then they'll be like, yeah, I'm going to take my wife and visit our local mosque. And I'm like, hold on. Right. <laughs> Let's, okay, now, well, I, all right, we just got to understand <laughs> the way my religious community is set up. <laughs> you know it's like, you never know what that's going to be like. But literally, whoever it is, I'm like, if there is a majority African-American masjid in your city, you're going to be okay going there. And Mm -hmm. usually we can tell by the name of the masjid. If it's like the Cleveland masjid of Alice Lama or something, go go. go there. You know what I mean? The black people uh, are there. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I mean? Any any place where you can go. and, And what's amazing about that is that you know, a lot of times these are going to be people who, like the elders there, converted with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Clara Muhammad and Malcolm X, and mm-hmm. you know what I mean. And like these are people that anybody can go there, and it's it's amazing that one of the things I think makes everybody in the world nowadays is drawn to, uh, and I, it's always been this way, but like as most of the world loses its connection with. Uh, uh, you know, aspects of meaning, like ways to engage the meaning of life, you know, so most people don't have a religious practice anymore. Mm-hmm. And the entire world looks to Black cultural and artistic expression to not only engage meaning, but to remember and have some sort of sense of like, what does it mean to be human? Mm. And the fact that you know, that African people are the mother and father of humanity, like literally the the origin of humanity, to still be the ones to teach what it is to be human, you know, on all fronts is is so fitting. And I mean, obviously sexuality is going to be, you know, at the heart of that, you know. At one hundred percent, I you know I'm just coming back from Los Angeles. I was there doing a workshop at Isla, mm. and that's 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 one of our favorite communities. We just we love it so much there. And I and I I talk to them about how what you see there is an example of prophetic love. You see that example of the, you know the brothers. There was a, a young fourteen year old brother who was taking his shahada, and it was after Juma. So there are all these. Black men standing out in the hallway, you know, big dudes or like beards. You know, I was one dude. I looked at him. I was like, I know he could fight. You know how you could look at somebody, you could tell if it's something go down, <laughs> I'm going to go stand next to him because he look like he could fight, right? right. <laughs> yeah, he look, he, he, he'll, he'll knock from... everybody out with one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and brother be named young... Kabir. 
<laughs> yeah, always, always. And he the one to teach martial arts on Jihad. the weekend. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So so the young brother, he's reciting his Shahada, and the men in the hallway, I don't even know if they realized they were doing it. They were all whispering it along with him. And it was just such a beautifully intimate nurturing moment. And, you know, my children, we live in Phoenix, Arizona. There's not a lot of, you know, there's a lot of African-Americans, but we don't really have like a a very active, vibrant African-American Muslim community. And my kids are like, mom, can we come back next weekend? Like, can we come back here every time? Uh, And I, yeah, I agree. I I came into, I came into Islam through the Tijani community that is situated uh, in a Worthdeen Muhammad masjid. And I I just, I'm so thankful that I had that experience because had I gone to some of these massages, I don't know. I don't know if it would have made it because, it, you know, it's it's so, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, and it, none of it is religious. It's all cultural. It's all cultural. Or a lack of culture. You know what I mean? Yes. Like I, 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 one of the things that like, you know, we're taught, like, especially those of us that converted and, you know, it's like, well, how come there's so much, how come there's all this weird stuff mm-hmm. with the Muslims? And a lot of times we say, well, you have to understand the difference between uh, religion and culture. And what I've learned from Dr. Rezma Minikim is uh, especially is like, man, that stuff is not culture. Like those are the those are the remnants and the like deculturization maybe of what those people have experienced when they were colonized, when they were you know going through their period of being you know stripped from their connection to their own past. Mm. But I mean, culture is always this. This is you know what he says, and I think there's something really to this. But like culture in itself always is pre- is is a, a preservation of meaning and of love. Mm-hmm. and of connection you know that like but as people lost their their own culture and they get mad at you when you don't lose yours that's right they get mad at you i've had people say oh sister angelica you know sometimes you're just a little too much i said but what is too much i'm not too much i'm not too much. oh you, you t- the way you talk you know if you just elevate your speech a little bit i said you know i talk like i talk in a way that people know exactly where i'm from and exactly who I am. And I'm speaking the language of the people. If that bothers you, if I have to, you know, put some bleach on, on who I am and just wash all the goodness out, then then I'll just be left with the shell of myself. And it's like we're all, a lot of us are chasing this false ideal that doesn't really exist. And we strip ourselves of our humanity when we do that. One of um, Resma Minikin's uh, students is a very close friend of mine. She's a part of our our sisters organization, and when she she's a Palestinian woman, Khadija Salim. She does a class on ancestral trauma, and she said, "I no longer say the word people of color. I say bodies of culture. Yeah, because we are not reduced to the color of our skin. We are people of culture, and and I think that speaks to 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 what you shared um, from Resma Minikin and just this idea that." Um, Culture is a way for us to continue to connect to our humanity in a world that constantly wants to dehumanize us. If you go to brotherali.com, you'll really see the kind of basis of our operation, all the stuff that we offer the world. I've been releasing music now since 2000 is when my first tape came out. It's when Rites of Passage dropped. That was the demo tape that I made in a hotel room in Houston, Texas. And if you go to brotherali.com in the join section, we've got a caravan area where we are building our own streaming platform of music, videos, uh, talks. And one of the things that you'll hear in there is an hour and a half long oral history of Rites of Passage, my demo tape from 2000. I just sat down and talked through all of the circumstances and stories of how that happened. And um, that's just for people that are on this journey and in this caravan with us. There's also a bunch of music there and videos. And I mentioned at the top of this thing that I'm going to go ahead and upload some of the radio commercials that I did early in my career. Um, 
I needed the money, man. But also they're kind of tight. <laughs> like Ant did the beats. It's me rhyming. Like, and they're they're fresh. Like I'm, you know, I was kind of like channeling the popular rap music at that time because they were for the radio. So I was like channeling Fabulous and Fat Joe and Jay-Z and that whole kind of world. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let the people hear them. But that's the kind of stuff that's not for everybody. Like, it's just not for everybody. Those are the people that are really on my side and in my corner. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to put those up there. But then also, I want you to know that over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be uploading a huge chunk of uh, guest verses and exclusives and features and just all kind of things that I've recorded. There's a project that me and BK1 did in 2007 called um, Off the Record. And BK, who's an amazing DJ, um, you know, along with a million other skills that he really has, he's an incredible editor and curator. It's just, he just really has a gift. And um, so he made a straight up mixtape of all of, of a bunch of my guest features and things up until that point. There's a, a feature that I did for Grouch and Lucky I Am. They had a, a project called Cool Man Association called Raise Up the Levels, a song I did for them. So that's on there. Uh, there's a joint on there that's produced by MF Doom that me and Slug did with Sage Francis. There's all type of stuff. That's on just off the record, the mixtape. So ever since 2007 though, I've done all these guest verses and all these features and I've just been compiling them and stockpiling them. Cause I'm like, someday somebody's gonna make part two, part three, part, but I mean, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's a joint with me and Wale. There's a joint with me and Sadat X and CL Smooth. There's a joint with Scarface and, uh, it doesn't look like we're probably going to have a DJ make a mixtape out of this stuff. So instead, we're going to take all of these things and upload them to the, the caravan section of brotherali.com. So you'll just have all of these exclusive things that I've done. I mean, there's talks on there. There's a video performance of when me and Evidence played at First Avenue when we did our, our Secrets and Escapes album. There's all kind of rare exclusive stuff. That's, that's there. If you go to brotherali.com, in the join section, you get down with that. If you go to the merch section, you'll see uh, the Brother Minister series that we did. We have that on cassette. We've got uh, those, those uh, hoodies and T-shirts and, and uh, sweatshirts and all this dope stuff. We got a uh, commemorative 15-year anniversary Uncle Sam Goddamn merch up there with uh, welcome to the United Snakes, Land of the Thief, Home of the Slave. That's we put on jackets and shirts and super dope. So a lot of that, if you just go to brotherali.com, that's this section of the podcast. It's just me letting you know that we're completely independent and that's the place to go for all of our shows, all of our special uh, community building stuff that we're doing. And also all of the merch is all there on brotherali.com. It's interesting, uh, you know, me and Dr. Bilal, we're connected at the very beginning of the pandemic. It's like one of those people, you know how there's certain people that you're like, I know where our paths are going to cross, inshallah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I feel like you just get this feeling like if I talk to this person, we already know each other. Mm -hmm. Like we're already best friends. We just haven't talked yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, so we got on the phone and we bonded really tough over the fact that he's just a few years ahead of me, but we converted around the same time in Minnesota. Mm. But when he converted, his parents had moved out to the suburbs to because you know the idea that you're going to get a better education out there. And so when he converted, it was in a mostly non-black community. It was like a lot of like Pakistanis and Arabs and stuff like that. And I converted in North Minneapolis, which is a you know historically black community, and I was with Imam Worthy Muhammad's community there, and we had such profoundly different experiences, mm -hmm. you know, with those early years, you know, and I think that culture is just it's 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 really imperative. It's it's like necessary. It's you know this idea that we would somehow like lose who we are when we come into Islam is um it's just such a a really crazy idea that I think uh, people are really convinced, though, you know, that, that, um, that, you know, for us to be our best selves, we would be shedding something about who we are and where we come from. As if Allah didn't know who we were when we were called. Mm -hmm. no? Allah knew who he was bringing into the fold. Yeah. That's one thing I love about Sheikh Mahi. Because mm -hmm. Sheikh Mahi has a lot of marids from like Atlanta, New York, and Detroit. And you know, Detroiters, we we special. 
we special. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, but he, it, it, you see, sometimes we, when he came to, to New York last year, you know, we're all the Marines, you know, we're going to visit him and stuff, and the Detroiters are there, and there's one brother, and he's just crazy. And Sheikh Mahi was just laughing and just smiling. He just got so much joy. Like, I feel... I can be in the presence of this man who is just a consummate scholar. He's just, I mean, he has hundreds of thousands of murids. And I can just be on the stage when he's sitting, uh, waiting to introduce him. And I'm like, to all of my Detroiters, what up, though? And he's just laughing and smiling. Like, you can be, you, you know, you can be you can be your full self. That's, that's one thing I love about being his student and being a part of the community. There's never this expectation that you have to show up as anything other than who you are. If you love Allah and you follow Islam, then you're welcome here. And, and how many of us, you know, how many of us don't get that? And how many of us have been lost on the path because we don't get that? It's deep because we also, I also have a sheikh. My sheikh is Sheikh uh, Muhammad Jailani from the Gambia. Oh, mashallah, yeah. One time we had a brother, like we went to, to the Gambia to visit Sheikh Muhammad and a brother from Detroit came with us. And... <laughs> <laughs> it was so dark, man. I've never told this story publicly before, but like I have to now. So, uh, <laughs> so this brother, he, uh, there was a guy who was visiting this gathering from Mauritania that was like what we call Majdub, which means mm -hmm. like I mean you already know, but like for the for people who don't, it means that somebody is just so, having such a spiritual experience that they're low key crazy, right? Like they're not experiencing the world. They're in a state of like, oh my god, everything's connected. And <laughs> and when you're like that, you you're like drunk in love with God and the Sheikh and the the Prophet and the community and the and the everything. This man was on that. But he was Mauritanian and he he had like this, the big robe and everything. And he was just saying all kind of far out stuff. And our brother from Detroit was really drawn to him. And he was listening to him and he was taking notes and he was coming back and he's like, did you hear what the Sheikh from Mauritania said? And in my mind, I'm like, like, we love this guy, but like, don't listen to him. <laughs> don't listen to the Sheikh. Don't listen to that guy. But my man was so drawn to him, you know? And... uh so eventually, my man from Detroit was like, "Can I want to sit with Sheikh Mohammed, uh, but I'm kind of nervous. Can you sit with me?" And I was like, "You don't need me to, but I will if you want me to." So we go in there. Oh, and one of the so one of the brothers from the Gambia kind of pulled my man from Detroit to the side and said, "Hey, we love this guy, but don't listen to him. Like he's a beautiful person. He's not one of our teachers. We love him. We love to be with him. We, you know, we eat with him. We hang out, but don't listen to him." So we went to this, we went and had this meeting with the brother from Detroit and Sheikh Mohammed. And our brother from Detroit says, all these people love you and they, they hang on every word you say and they kiss your hand and they want to be with you and they want to, and like, I think you're dope, but I don't know you like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so Sheikh Mohammed just goes, oh, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> And, he, and Sheikh Muhammad said, look, man, this whole thing is just about being together. Like we be together, we hang out together, we spend time together. And if you if you ever fall and you need our help, we help you. Uh, but anybody that, he said, you always know this, if somebody wants you to treat them like a king, that's not the Sheikh. Mm -hmm. But if a person is good, just happy being with you, then that's the Sheikh. And so he said, oh, okay, well, maybe you're my Sheikh. And Sheikh Muhammad <laughs> said, yeah, so, you know, either way, we just want to be together. It doesn't matter. We just want to be together. So then the, then the brother from Detroit says, hey, uh, we're not supposed to listen to this guy from Mauritania, right? And Sheikh Mohammed said, oh, who, who told you that? Who said that? And, and uh, my man from Detroit was like, uh, somebody just told me don't listen to him. Said he's crazy. And Sheikh Mohammed said, who said that though? Was it a Gambian or was it a visitor? He said it was a Gambian. Because, you know, in Sheikh Muhammad's mind, it's like, we don't talk about people like that. Mm -hmm. Like, there are ways to do things. There are ways to, you know, if somebody is having a conversation to be like, hey, do you guys want tea? You know, there's way, there, there, are, there are polite ways to do that. And I noticed that in West Africa, nobody is ever like untribed. There's nobody mm -hmm. who can't come around. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? I know, I know mm -hmm. there's people here that have traumas and been through stuff and there's all kind of all kind of complicated stuff going on. Nobody's kicked out. Mm -hmm. Nobody can't come around. Yep. Nobody's unfriended. Nobody's canceled. Like, yep. there's ways for everybody to be around. So Sheikh Mohammed is like, in his mind, I know Sheikh Mohammed is thinking, 
if one of my if one of my <laughs> direct people that's with me every day is telling visitors not to listen to somebody, we're gonna have a conversation about mm-hmm. that. <laughs> and and my man from Detroit can sense it. And so he's like, he's like, was it a Gambian or a visitor? And he's like, a Gambian. And Sheikh Mohammed said, oh, who? Which one? And so Jay can sense that he's trying to figure out. And so he just stands up and he goes, no, <laughs> I'm from Detroit, man. We don't snitch. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> and so Sheikh Mohammed just cracks up laughing. <laughs> <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. The brother said, no snitching, no snitches. Snitches get stitches, mashallah. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. So Sheikh Mohammed turns to me and he says in Arabic, he says, labas, which means like in Arabic, it's like, it doesn't matter. Tell him, don't worry about it. Tell him it doesn't matter. Labas. But the brother who said that to him's name is Abbas. And so homie from Detroit was like, did you say Abbas? Because that's who told me. <laughs> and Sheikh Mohammed goes, oh, snitching, snitching. <laughs> And so it's like, man, <laughs> just the layers of like, of of realness and beauty and you know what I mean? It's like in that conference, it's like when you're around the people of Allah, it's like, these are the things that happen. Man, I, I, I hope it's okay to tell a story from my wife. I think she, I think she would be okay with this. But we went in there one time and my wife was like, yeah, you know, I'm a therapist, but what led me there was were, were my issues. And so she's telling him, you know, I have anxiety and I have this and I have that and I have all these like, you know, diagnoses and things. And Sheikh Mohammed said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just a black woman. Mm. And so the you carry a lot of stress, you carry a lot of trauma and the world just tells you that something's wrong with you. But there's nothing wrong with you. And I mean, she just, you know, broke down, you know. And he said, just remember that uh, the city of Mecca is a gift to the world that was actually given to a black woman. Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh. our entire Qibla, like you're the Qibla of our whole religion. Wow. SubhanAllah. Nothing's wrong Oof. with you. Like you can go to therapy and you could be a therapist, mashallah. That's great. You should keep doing that. <laughs> but just like you know what I mean, like like there are certain messages that have to be delivered by certain people. Mm-hmm. Like nobody else can give that. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I just the the work that you do is just so because it's you. It's got to be you. It's got to be like that. Uh, you know, all the messengers came speaking the tongue of their people, and if you weren't you, and also like you're not like. The way that I expect, like I said, I only watch the live. I'm not in the, the private joints, but I don't see any like super hood characteristics or anything like that. Like it seems like, I, like you you're know, just you. Yeah, and and I but but I I think this person just wasn't okay with me being just me. You know, I think mm. they have this idea, you know, I'm 48, I'm a mother, they think I'm supposed to like talk like a college professor. I'm like, all the college professors I know talk like me. Like there's like this, there's nothing the good ones. Yeah, the good ones. I, and I, I think there's this this they want me to have this adjacency to to dominant culture that that this respectability politics which just doesn't it doesn't work on it doesn't work on me and I've never I never put myself in spaces that I have to silence or censor myself mm-hmm. I, I I teach internationally I've and not not just with village auntie work you know with public health here in the state of Arizona like people know me people know me nationally I, I right. present on 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 national academic conferences and I speak the same way and when I'm in when I'm in workshops with sisters the only difference is I might talk about about things that I don't talk about, you know, on social media, but it's the same affect. But I think, um, you know, this, the person who said it was not black, and I mean, she, she duh. just, <laughs> yeah, she, you know, she right. just had this. But she's also, well, she's also was a, a, a woman of color. She was a body of culture herself. She was a brown woman, mm-hmm. and what I saw in her comment to me was a fear that she had for herself. She was projecting her own fears yes, yes. and insecurities about how she could show up. Right. So. You're making me uncomfortable because you're showing up in a way that I could never imagine. So, you know, she she wound up coming around. She's still kind of like uncomfortable, and that's fine because I'm not going to change. But at least we, we we were able to have a conversation and she could think a little bit more. We went to a, one time we went to a, one of those like retreats that Sheikh Mohammed was at. And there was mm-hmm. some other there was like some white sheikhs there. Which like certain brown people just love white shakes so much, and those they white do. shakes be dope. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like they're amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like if there's like 
if if like a white person validates Islam for them, they're just like, yes, thank you, Allah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like white people are here. You know what I mean? It's like it's amazing. You know. Um, and sometimes, like I've been booked in situations like that. It's like, oh, you can invite me, I'm, you, but you're not going to like what I have to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, and uh, so me and my wife went, and they kept asking my wife. So they knew that I was a, uh, I'm an MC, mm -hmm. but they they kept asking my wife, when are you going to perform? And people kept confusing her with Sakina from Poetic Pilgrimage. Oh, la ilaha illallah. They look Who's nothing like, alike. Nothing. They nothing. look nothing alike. Like, nothing. And we love Sakina. I mean, Sakina is yes. ill. Sakina is a fellow Tajani of yours, yeah, too. Yeah, she's as one you of know. my close, she's one but of my close, close friends. Beautiful. We we traveled one time, actually, for our 10th anniversary, 10 years ago. Uh, we went to London and we hung out with her and Muhammad Yahya. Oh, mashallah. And um, man, and we we saw, you know, the whole commit Sheikh Babakir and like, man, oh, Ab and his yes. daughter. And like, I love those people, man. That community is like, yeah, golden. And we went and kicked it with them. So it's like, that's not, a, that's a compliment. But also yeah. like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about? And we experienced just the level of microaggressions, both from my wife and her body. And then me also for like the art that I do, that I, mm. like I'm a culture worker. Mm -hmm. And I just, the way they were saying like, hey, do you want to rap for the kids? Like, will you just, we just like come out here and rap for the kids. And it's like, have you ever heard my music? My music is not for your damn kids. No. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like your kids, you're not gonna like what again. You will not like what I'm talking about in my music. It's not for your children. Like I don't know what you thought this was, you know. Um, and we almost left. Like we were gonna go, like get a hotel and just like come for when the shakes were speaking. And then I just witnessed something unfold in that community that just made me realize. Like it just came. Like I'm so used to oppressed people being poor mm -hmm. that I thought. Oppression and poor and like poverty go together. And since these people are affluent, you know what I'm saying? Like they're doctors and engineers and they live where white people live, they drive what white people drive. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't realize that they are poor oppressed. But also I didn't necessarily register it right away either. And mm -hmm. I realized, like, oh, these are people that have been colonized. They have all sorts of self-hatred and internalized white supremacy. And they got colorism and they got all of these inferiority complexes and everything else. And I was like, man, these people need the sheikh for different reasons than I need the sheikh, but they need the medicine too, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, man, what you said about the about the fear that people have and the fact that you don't have that fear mm -hmm. is enough to just be like, I can't be in the same space as you. Not being mm -hmm. all like how you are like that. Not just mm -hmm. being natural and unapologetic and mm -hmm. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's going to be difficult for me. <laughs> They don't like it. It, it like, you know, because I do storytelling with the moth. So I travel mm. to all of these, you know, cities and, you know, mashallah, some amazing. And I remember I did a show and one of the sisters came up to me at intermission. And she was like, oh, my gosh, I could never do what you do. I said, what am I doing? She's like, you're just cracking jokes. Because one of the things I say, like, especially if I go to a like a very white town, mm -hmm. I went to Boulder, Colorado. I said, um, I know y'all probably don't have a black relative, but at the end of the night, I'm going to be your black cousin, your black Muslim cousin, so put some smoked turkey in my greens. And you know, it's like, oh, 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 right? And I was serious, right? Yeah. Was like, oh. Or some sort of seasoning of right. some sort. Yeah, something. Yeah, something. You had to put some seasoning. So she's like, Squeeze oh. a lemon on it. Something. <laughs> I could never, I just, I would be so scared if I was just standing up and talking in front of all these white people. I said, well, white people are people too. I said, I, what, mm -hmm. you know, what, and, and at, well, I wound up being one of the best shows that I was in, but it shows like people have this like visceral fear of showing up just as who they are in a space. And that's, that's one, one thing that I hope when people engage with me, that they can at least see that. Like you can be, you can be yourself. My, my daughter we moved to Saudi Arabia when my oldest daughter was two. <laughs> so for her, Saudi is very much like home for her. Okay. And it's only been, I'll say in the last six months, that I got her to be comfortable with saying that she's Black. Mm. And I didn't realize it until she was like, Mom, you know, I want to join the Black Student Union. She I was like, the what? Black, no. I was like, what? She was like, you know, it's like... It's the Black Student Union. I was like, yeah, you can say that with your chest, girl. Like, what are you? Because my husband is, ve he's very like, you know, he's from Ghana. He's very, he's quiet. Like, he's not on social media, but we're very like kind of militant in our house. And I'm mm. like, what? Are you, why are you whispering Black? She's like, mom, you know, but it's not nice to say. Because we were out somewhere and I said, oh, 
that that lady is pretty. She said, who? I said, the black lady right there. She's like, mom, shh. And I, so I had to have a conversation with her. And she had internalized this idea that black, like she's was happy to be black, but she had internalized this idea that black was somehow less than, mm-hmm. or it was considered an insult because the people that she went to school with, mm-hmm. some of them, it was an insult. They would they would say, you know, Yabi is my American friend, not Yabi is my black American friend. And I, I wanted to make sure that I got that, got her straight on that, because I don't want her to grow up with that, with that sense of fear. But I think being in a in a uh growing up in Jidda at the time where we were there, that is something that was deeply, deeply ingrained. So I guess I'm just sharing that because even when children grow up in a very, um, I'll say, Black positive household, they can still take on some of these traits of fear. So Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah wrote a paper that's called Islam in the Black Im- or Islam in the Cultural Imperative. Yes, one of my favorites. One of the things that Dr. Omar mentions in that paper is the fact that uh, you know, there were, it was Eid and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like in his mosque and some of the Africans, because like that community was inc- incredibly diverse, as you know, some of the Africans were drumming mm-hmm. and dancing inside the mosque. And, you know, some of the companions, I believe it was Omar radiallahu an, that said uh, like, we, we should tell them they shouldn't do that. Like they should stop. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like, no, this is their culture. Everybody has Eid. Everybody has a, a thing in them that celebrates. And this is how they celebrate. And so let them do it. And I, I know you know the story, but I'm telling for the people that don't. And so then uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, most of the ladies he married were older than him, but one was younger, our mother Aisha. And she wanted to see, but people were crowding around. And so she got up on his shoulders. He picked her up on his shoulders like at a music festival, like how you see a lot of times people at a music festival. And she watched for a while. And then he said, are you good? You seen enough? And she was like, no, I'm watching this. And so he stayed for a while longer. And Dr. Omar mentions that that in Islam and the cultural imperative. And then basically his what he says is like, Islam doesn't take hold in a place until people make culture around it. And Resma says the same mm. thing. Like white people, are, white bodies are always coming to Resma and saying like, what do I do? And he says, you have to create culture. The Ku Klux Klan has mm-hmm. culture. They got songs they mm-hmm. got sing. They got ways they bury their dead. They got ways that they're born. They got robes that they wear. They got all this stuff that's like culture that makes white supremacy second nature to them. You're going to have to get with other white people that feel the way you feel and build anti-racist culture. And he's like, and that's none of our business. You're just going to have to figure that out. So one of the things that I think about when I see the work that you do, and I didn't realize this until recently, but like you have almost built what appears to me like a sorority around (laughs) the work that you do. Where it's like a secret mm-hmm. society, and there's there's colors, mm-hmm. and there's you know what I'm saying. So I, like yeah. I, I th- that is so incredibly amazing, and I just like whatever you feel like sharing about that. I I really I'm I'm extremely interested in that. Yeah, so it's it's it 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 feels like a sorority. So we don't call ourselves a sorority. In- because we don't necessarily have the same structure. But it is a secret society. So I I have a degree in African-American and African studies. And one of the things that intrigued me when I started studying West and East African cultures in depth was the existence of these secret societies called age-grade societies. So you know, if you're around the same age, you go out and you go through rites of passage together and you sort of go through all of these periods of life together. Lots of societies have it. There's a city in Japan that has the most people over 100 years old of any city in the world. And one of the things that they talk about is that, you know, this lady was like, I'm 103. Me and this lady over here have been friends since we were nine years old. Allah. So I, I knew that I needed culture because I live in Phoenix and it's... First of all, I got to get out of Phoenix soon, but that's a whole other conversation, right? But I, I needed that community, and I realized a lot of women needed that community. So we base it off of these age-grade societies, particularly the ones that come out of Nigeria, Senegal, and Mali, and then also the divine nine Black Greek fraternity and sororities with the colors and the jackets. And it, it's all just sort of happened organically. And it's built around my, my flagship class, Foundational Womanhood, which is a 13-week rites of passage program for adult women. 
So we have our own iconography. We have our colors. We have our name, which is kept secret until you have gone through the class, right? We have our hand symbol, which, you know, I can tell you what that means. It's it's a stylized version of the American Sign Language for together. So mm. there's a particular sign language. So when you see us doing this, it, it means together. Uh, we have, you know, symbols. But you put a little drip on it. Like, you it's know, not just a straight. Just, just, like, just a little, just a little, just a little, 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 little bit, little smoke, you know. Put a little smoked turkey in it. <laughs> A little smoke turkey, little Lowry's on it, you know. <laughs> right? We have, we have our, you know, we have our colors. We have certain language, you know. There's certain words that when you when you say this, so it's it's Subhanallah, and this is only from Allah. In the last three years, we started this during the pandemic. In the last three years, we have grown the organization to 340 plus women. There are currently 98 women who are in their process now. So in January, we will be over 400. We have 18 city chapters. We have a city chapter in Rotterdam. I had to look up what country Rotterdam was in because I didn't know. I've done rap shows in Rotterdam. Listen, it's cra- we have sisters as far as Indonesia, uh, sisters who, you know, South Korea, Germany, all over the United States, all, from all different backgrounds. Um, it's interfaith. It's intercultural. It's intergenerational. The oldest sister who has ever graduated from the program is 68. The youngest who has ever graduated from the program is 19. Um, the girls, I call them girls, the ones who are young, but the, the the daughters of some of the women have married the sons of some of the sisters who have gone through the program. They're catching each other's babies. They're flying cross country, cross world to go visit each other and stand in each other's weddings. It is just subhanAllah. And it, and I'm not at the center of it. Uh, it's the women. It's the community. And we, we, are, we are building this culture. And I'm glad that you see that and recognize it because some people are like, oh, that's Village Auntie's social club. It's so much more than that. It's so much deeper than that. We just had a class this past weekend with Maimuna Yusuf, Mumu Fresh. Yeah. She's a part of our faculty for the program. And, you know, just the, the, the number of people who pour into the space, but the space is built on this decolonial praxis. It's built on this idea that we are not just liberating liberating our bodies, we're liberating our minds, and we are creating culture that is a part of that process. My daughters, you know, even they don't know the, the, the name of the organization. They just know that we have it. And they're like, don't, Mom, don't, I can't wait. I can't don't. wait until I get to wear my colors. I'm like, okay, That's we have hard. this. We have a, a graduation where they do like short films. It's just, it's it's crazy. It's it's subhanAllah. Sometimes I sit back and I'm like, if I didn't create it, I would want to be a part of it. And that's that's what I've always wanted this to be. Man, that's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible. And I mean, that's how, you know, so many times like when, uh, you know, when, when an organization or when uh, a movement is built around a person, who is dynamic and charismatic and you are those things and somebody who is qualified to lead and you are that obviously. And when somebody, you know, just has that kind of, that kind of dynamism that, that draws people to them, like you so obviously do, the big struggle is like, how do we create something that can outlive that person? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I mean, that's it. I mean, you have like all of these like cultural things built into it. It's like, you know, there, there are people who are out here b b boying and you know breaking, and they had to be taught later who Cool Herc is and who Bambada mm. is and who Crazy Legs is and who you know they had to be taught that stuff later because these things are like so inculcated in people and they're so codified in culture that you know you can learn those things later, and I mean that that's incredibly profound and I mean that's when you start having a movement that will absolutely inshallah be multi generational. I wanted to live beyond me. And I, you know, I've certified, I think we have so far eight women mm-hmm. that I've certified. So they're officially Village Auntie certified, but I don't lead the meetings that we have every month. I don't lead every class. I'm not, I have no problem creating other leadership spaces for sisters because that's one of the that's one of the 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 frailties of some of the organizations in the Black community is that we stay in the leadership position for too long. I'm Look, always going to be the founder of this space. Yeah. Right? right. I ain't got to be the, the the head for 65 years. Oh that don't work. Oh, my Lord. Right? 
I so I I and and I'm I'm facing that now in the organization that I work with because I still have a full time I do all that stuff and I still have a full time day job yeah. right and I've seen what happens when the leader stays in place too long I will always be the creator of this organization I will always be the founder of this movement that is set in stone there's nothing that that keeps me from putting another person up I don't leave my own graduation. I, I I come in, I speak for five minutes, and I sit down and I watch like everyone else. That also does something. That also is decolonial. Mm-hmm. This idea that I don't have to just uh-huh. hold on to power. I don't have to be like you know the dictators in some of these countries who stay in, in power for six decades. It's tiring. I don't want that. And I don't. I think that that's how we allow cultures and movements to flourish because there's going to be new blood. There's going to be new leadership. I don't know everything. Let me make space for people who do know things. And that's that's why I think, because someone was like, how do you get so many sisters and brothers to just love you so much? I said, I lo- because I love them. Mm-hmm. And I have to show them how much I love them. And if I give you this thing that I created and I say, <clears throat> I want you to help me lead this, what better demonstration of love do you have than trust? And that's what we're, that's what we're creating, I hope, inshallah. Yeah, make it your own. Like make it your own. Like bring it. bring bring yourself to it, and it's such a it's such a um, it's such a demonstration of your own faith in the underlying truth of the message. You know what I mean? That like the truth of the message is bigger than you. Like you are the vessel that Allah chose for it. Like you said, like you you know you being the founder, you're the one that Allah chose for that specific you know role. But like to to really have faith in the message of it is to understand that like man Allah will care for this thing and this truth has a life of its own it has rights of its own and it it, it will continue to to live and flourish. We've been rocking from day one on the Travelers Podcast with Zakat Foundation. Z-A-K-A-T is the pillar in Islam uh, where Muslims give back and share what we've been blessed to have. And Zakat Foundation isn't a Muslim-led organization, but they don't only help Muslims and they don't use their work to proselytize. And so often when these things come up in the world, these big calamities, whether it's the earthquake in Syria and Turkey, whether it's the, it's the situation that popped off in Ukraine, uh, and now this absolute nightmare that's happening in Gaza and Palestine and Palestine over and over and over again. You know, before being so connected with the uh, Zakat Foundation, I remember like when stuff happened, a tsunami or a flood or an earthquake, I would be scrambling to try to figure out like, what can I do? Um, you know, do I even have a little bit of money that I can share with these people that I'm just seeing this footage of them suffering? But how do I know which organization to give to? Who can you trust? How do you know that the aid is actually going to reach the people? I haven't had extensive relationships with any of these orgs, but the one that I've worked with the closest is the Zakat Foundation. And I know what their philosophy is. I know what their intention is. I know the way that they seek to work with people on the ground and let them be in the driver's seat. And a lot of these places, they're already on the ground. And so, you know, Zakat Foundation was already doing tremendous humanitarian work in Palestine. And so for them to be mobilized in this moment is a lot harder though, because the it's blocked. Like the humanitarian aid is intentionally being blocked. The people's water has been blocked, their food has been blocked, their gas has been blocked, their electricity has been cut. Um, I mean, it's it's all of the basic essentials of life. There have been times where, you know, their their telecommunications and their Wi-Fi have gone out. You know, it's really, very difficult to get aid in there right now. But Zakat Foundation is working day and night trying to get whatever they can, you know, into Gaza and into the country to be able to just serve the basic needs of people. And they have incredible work that they do all over the world. They got a orphan program, they've got meals programs. And they like I said, they don't only help 
Muslims and they don't use that work to to proselytize. That's just not the the idea. And so the Ukraine, for example, is a place that doesn't have a good history with Muslims. But when the Ukrainians were suffering, the Zakat Foundation stood up and said, we don't care what our political relationship with these people has been. They're being oppressed and they need humanitarian aid. These are human beings that need clothing and shelter and water and food and uh, first aid. And so they sent that there. So that's the type of organization they are, and we're very grateful to be working with them. Go to Zakat US on social media. You can follow their work. If you go to Zakat, to Z-A-K-A-T dot org, you can tap in and find a project on there that makes sense to you. And just put something on it and know that for as much as people are working on trying to get this aid to the people that need it the most, Zakat Foundation is right there on the front lines. We're grateful to be rocking with them. Okay, we work with BetterHelp on this podcast, and BetterHelp is an online therapy platform. It's basically a big network of licensed, trained, professional mental health workers uh, from various backgrounds and disciplines around the world. And the reason that I mess with them is because that's where I go for therapy. I don't live in America. I don't have a job. I found out about BetterHelp on a podcast. I use it and I've really benefited from it tremendously. And I've just known so many people that have had that experience as well. But I wanna say at this moment that there was, there was something that was circulating online, on TikTok in particular. There was a video that somebody made. And I think that at some point, maybe the Israeli government uh, tweeted that they had some exclusive kind of deal with BetterHelp where BetterHelp was providing free support for Israeli soldiers and Israeli citizens and people on that side of the conflict occupation. And so there were people that were boycotting BetterHelp. And when I heard that, I was like, oh man, do I need to, like, is that something that I should be considering doing? Because if somebody were to take sides like that in that in, in this sort of uh, arrangement, I don't know if I could continue to rock with it. The whole thing is about access. And so BetterHelp, released a statement and we actually reached out to them and asked them specifically about it. And they released a public statement that says, in not so many words, uh, that, that that actually was false information, uh, that they had some exclusive deal with the Israeli government, soldiers, citizens, but that in these cases where there are, you know, nightmares that human beings are experiencing, BetterHelp actually has a history of showing up and offering free service to everybody involved. And so they said very specifically, we are helping Palestinians, we're helping uh, Israelis, we're helping anybody that we can gain access to, we're providing free mental health care for those people. And so that put my heart to ease. Uh, with that particular issue. And so I'm going to continue uh, this partnership that we have with BetterHelp because of what I see in that particular statement uh, is courageous on their part because, you know, there there are people that are under attack for things that they've said and done and or not said and not done. And for them to come out and say like, no, we're not, everybody in this situation is human. These are all people that deserve to have access and that's what we're about. And I appreciate that. And so we're gonna continue the partnership with them. If you go to betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash travelers, that'll let you know that we sent you there. You fill out a um, like a form online and then you pick your uh, therapist and then you choose how and when you want to communicate with them and you start doing it right away. If you've got financial hardship, like most people do in this moment, you let them know about that. And then they sometimes will even recalculate your rate and try to uh, give you some discounts for what's going on. And if the therapist that you have doesn't feel like a perfect fit. So like I'm on my third therapist on BetterHelp. The first one I had was really dope. I did great work with her. And then uh, she went back to in-person care when the pandemic was over. And so I was sad about that, but it happens, you know, I understand. Then I had this amazing, like kind of auntie who was a very wise person, had incredible things to say, but I tried a few sessions with her and I'm like, man, as great as this is, and like if you had a podcast, I'd listen to it. You're a wise person with great things to say, but this, you're not tailoring this to me. I'm in therapy not to kick it with a wise elder because I can kick it with a wise elder 
and not pay the amount of money that therapy costs. But like, I'm here specifically for therapy, not something therapeutic, but to sit in an intentional space and time that we hold with a trained mental health professional who's not also my homie um, to just talk about what's going on with me. I can come in here and I can be messy. I can have big emotions. I can be mean if I need to. I can, you know, uh, talk crazy if I need to. I just get to really be in this completely enveloping healing space that's just about me for an hour every week. And that's what I need. And I think that's what a lot of people need and a lot of people deserve. So if you go to betterhelp.com slash travelers, you actually get a discount. Uh, we get a commission here for making the connection. And I think it's a good thing for everybody. So check out betterhelp.com slash travelers. What would it mean for the for the Muslim community and for the, you know, for the public health community? to really get behind and support what you're doing? And is that something that you are interested in? Mm, I think I used to have a lot of, my hopes for the Muslim community were a lot higher a few years ago mm -hmm. than they are now. Hmm. And surprisingly, once I let go of the idea, cause I first came in like, Muslims are gonna love this. Wrong, <laughs> wrong, right? Uh, once I stop trying to convince people that what I'm doing is not haram, what I'm doing is to save marriages and to save families, once I gave up believing that they were going to believe me, now they're starting to support me. Mm -hmm. So now when people realize, well, she's not going to shut up, let me listen to what she's actually talking about, now I'm getting more support. And it would be nice, right? It would be nice, but I, I don't, I'm not naive enough to think that I'm going to get wholesale um, support. You know, people ask me, why aren't you at this conference? Why aren't you at that conference? I'm like, they, they're they not going to invite me because they, they, one, I don't look appropriate for a lot of these spaces. Two, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm too much of who I am. And three, people are still afraid. But surprisingly, the public health community has really given me a lot of support. Once they got past a lot of internalized Islamophobia, mm -hmm. Massage noir and anti blackness, uh, and people realize, oh, wait, you're not just a quote unquote influencer on, on, you know, you actually, you know, I write curricula. I'm doing a research project right now with Arizona State University on using narrative storytelling as a therapeutic intervention for people living with HIV. You know, I have published papers. So now I'm getting invited to academic conferences and spaces. So the public health, and they're, they're seeing the intersection between spiritual communities and public health, you know, how we can reduce the disparities. And that's that's really ultimately my goal is so that people can live healthier lives. But with the Muslim community, I just, I go, I go where I am watered and where I'm nurtured. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to Masjid Allah in Philly. I'll go to Masjid Kuba in Philadelphia, Detroit. You know, I'm, I'm be at the Muslim Center, uh, uh, Isla in Los Angeles, Atlanta Masjid. You know, I'll go to those places that I know that people support me. And you know, whoever else doesn't, you know, there's some there's some late comers, some late adopters. Mm -hmm. And you know, if they come, fine. If they don't, I I, I have to, to to have faith and know that what I'm doing uh, is is necessary and is needed. And those who who need me will find me inshallah you know so i when i was blessed to join one of the lives that you did the other day and you were talking about just the moment that we're in and the increased islamophobia and you know with the the nightmares that are unfolding in palestine and also the tremendous faith in humanity and just resilience and magic of the Palestinian people and children and elders and men and, you know, babies and women and everybody, you know. Um, but you were saying that you, uh, if I understood correctly, I think you were saying that like you started to, after 9-11, you were like, you know what, I wear this hijab every day. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and uh, it just made me think about how moments, how certain difficult and challenging moments can really be the impetus that we need to to um, to to make certain decisions about how we're going to move forward, you know. And I, I wonder mm -hmm. if you could just talk about a little bit about this particular moment and what your message is and how, how you've been, what, what, how your community that, and the students are showing up and the things that are, conversations that are happening there. Mm, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think I've been 
intimately connected to the Palestinian struggle since I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And I got, I, I first understood what the Palestinians dealt with by listening to the work of Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, listening to the words of, of Malcolm X, reading, um, you know, Angela Davis and seeing how interconnected the Black liberation and Palestinian liberation struggle were. So, you know, and I've lived through you know, intifadas. I've lived through uprisings. And right now, as, as a person who's a student of history, mm -hmm. I always say I'm like a college professor without a PhD and no classroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when I look at the, the world right now, this is this is a turning point. It's a, people are waking up and finally, you know, taking the scales off of their eyes. And within our community, we have a lot of Palestinian sisters who from the very beginning have gravitated towards a space that is helmed by a Black woman because they see that commonality and, and, and solidarity. Uh, but we also have some sisters who are afraid. And the, the live that I was doing that day, you know, the sister was saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm afraid to wear my hijab because of Islamophobia. Listen, they're going to hate you anyway. So why not why not be proud and stand in that? You know, a lot of people after 9-11 hid their Islam. You know, they changed their names. They stopped wearing hijab. And that didn't get us any any further. I take people back to the literature. I take people back to the to to, to what our ancestors and what our elders have said about what's happening right now. And, and what can we as women, especially, that's why I did that nine things you can do uh, carousel on Instagram. Everybody can do something. Nobody can do every everything, but everybody can do something. So we're, you know, we had a healing circle. We have a, a, a thicker circle that we do every Thursday and we make dua for Palestine. There is a sister in the community who's a medical doctor. We're going to be working with her and a somatic therapist to, you know, talk about what does this mean in, in your body? What does oppression feel like in the body? How does it conjure up ancestral trauma? I'm a big person who talks about ancestral trauma. And that's what we see right now with, you know, with people who were traumatized now becoming the people who are doing the massacres and the annihilation. And what does it mean when that is not healed? Yeah. Um, but I was talking to my dear friend, Khadija. And Khadija is a therapist. She's been doing one-on-one -on -one support for a Palestinian women who are living in Gaza. And she told me, you know, we had this session. <clears throat> and after the session, one of the women said to me, don't forget about the Black people in America. She said, because they are the ones who gave us the language for, for liberation in this conversation. So this woman, in the midst of the, the, the annihilation of her people, is remembering the, the, the Black people in America. And that, to me, means that you know, when I get people who say, why are you so concerned with people who you who you don't know? They are me. Mm -hmm. We are the same. All of our all of our all of these struggles and these conflicts are interconnected. Mm -hmm. A few months ago, we had a whole um, session for Sudan. My best friend is from Sudan. You know, we've talked about the Congo. So my my work is showing people how all of this is connected. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Our police force is trained by the IDF. So it's th these are the conversations that I can have in these smaller spaces with women, like connect the dots and see what, what you can do. Maybe you can't go to a protest, but can you watch somebody's baby so that she can, right? Maybe you can't, you know, you don't have a lot of money to donate to a cause, but can you make food for people who are having a sit-in, you know, at, at a college campus? There's always something that we can do. And, and this is, this is, I love times like this because it shows the world it shows us what the world actually thinks That's of right. us. Yep. So we don't have to put on air. Yes. It shows you. Now yes. you see. Yes. So now yeah. if the blinders are off, yep. so now move accordingly. Yep. They don't like you anyway. That's they didn't right. like you without your hijab. They're not going to like you with your hijab. Mm -hmm. They didn't like you when your name was Muhammad. They don't like you when your name is Mo like. So just be yourself. Yeah. I love this time. I don't love the, the persecution no, and the deaths yeah. and the annihilation. I don't love that. But I love that people are finally seeing like, it's like, see, this is what we've been trying to tell you. And it's as plain as day. Social media has made it very apparent. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that those of us who are waking up continue to stay awake and continue to use this as a moment to build. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those, those like truth moments are, you know, for people who live in what, what other others find to be uncomfortable truth, the moments where other people are forced to deal with it is just kind of like, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's just kind of like a, we've been dealing with this all this time. <laughs> like, you knew, you don't Welcome say, to the club. 
You don't say. <laughs> yeah, man. Wow. So you feel discriminated <laughs> against. What's that feel like? Yeah, it's it's yeah. Yeah. It's wild. And you know what's what, what's wild. really deep is um so one of the things that Malcolm said Resma says and and it reminds so Resma basically says, you know, if if a person is in a white body and they want to work with people uh you know to build culture around uh, you know, anti-racist culture. He's like, you know, it's going to take generations, by the way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And like when white bodies are together, the amount of rage that comes to the, to the, to the forefront is really profound. And, you know, he says, you have to build culture. And for me, like I go to when the lady went to, to visit Malcolm in, uh, at Harvard and she's like, Mr. X, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know why everyone's so mad at you. I think everything you say is true. And I just want to, and what can I do to help? And he says, nothing. And he leaves. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, it looks like this super cold moment. But if you think about it, it's like, you've done enough. Thank you. And I mean, the whole idea mm-hmm. of the Nation of Islam is like, we will take care of ourselves. We got it from here. We appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. Or not. But like, this is, where the, from, from, this is where we go now. But in his autobiography, he writes, I wish I could. He said, after I went to Mecca, he says, you know, I wish that I could see her and talk to her again. Because now that I've been to Mecca, I realize that just because a person is in a body that's called white doesn't mean that that's what they have to be in in their own identity, Mm -hmm. in their own relationships with themselves, with the idea of whiteness, with the world, with the... And, you know, he came home and wrote in the book, if I could tell her that you should start ministering to your people, like if you really believe, like you don't need to come mm-hmm. to the black community to do that. You live where the problem starts. So you have an opportunity to say something That's there. It. And then the idea of building culture, you know, when Malcolm came home and said, if the person who thinks they're white in America would study Islam, it would be a, a rehumanizing process for them, you know? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I find to be interesting is like so for so much of my public where i've been talking to people who see themselves as white who the world has said is white for the last 400 years and like well what okay so how do i fully acknowledge the truth of this thing that i'm connected to and it's it's so hard to 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 pick apart well which parts of this are my love for my grandmother and which parts of this are the lynching of someone's grandfather like how do I, how, you know what I mean? Like wh- how do I love myself and my gra- and my grandparents and my and my family and my own humanity while divorcing myself of all of this indoctrination that I've gone through over all this time? And what I'm finding now is that I have otherwise very radical friends who also have a connection in their mind and heart to like you know Israel is a, is is part of me and like and and they're having this moment now where they're having to really wrestle with what if who i think i am is a lie like what if i've been lied to about mm. who i actually am and what if somebody's process of dehumanizing somebody else is what i've been told i am but i'm actually not and then the thing is like, okay, but the, but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, Clara Muhammad, you know what I'm saying? Like they all said the so-called Negro. Like in order for in order for black people to be free, it's like, I'm not what the world has told me I am for the last 400 years. I was here bef- long before any of this stuff and I will be here long after. And these people are actually my children. You know what I mean? So like w- the same process that Islam has for like rehumanizing on one side of the coin, it also offers on the other. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's just such a trip that like mm. every generation or like every decade almost, there's something else that comes along that offers an opportunity for somebody to wake up out of their sleepwalking. But it's hard mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have to do it, it is. <laughs> if you don't, if the if, if nothing forces you to do it, it's like ah, it's, mm-hmm. sleeping is nice though. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of us, a lot of us are comfortable being asleep. One of my, yeah. one of my closest friends, I call her my mm. forever home girl. She's a white Jewish woman, and we had a conversation when I was in New York a couple of weeks ago. One of the most radical conversations I've had about this whole issue. And she's like, you know, I had to confront very, before this, like very early on, I had to confront the racism, the Islamophobia the xenophobia that I grew up with in Jewish communities. She talked about growing up in a progressive synagogue where they had, you know, a ceremony for someone who was a part of the LGBTQ community 
who had a new gender identity that they adopted and they had a ceremony for them. So very progressive in one instance, Mm -hmm. but very racist and Islamophobic in the other. Mm -hmm. And she came out on social media and she said in her stories, she's like, I need to talk to my people. So if you are a Jewish person and you are struggling right now with the ways in which we have been lied to our whole lives, get at me. She's like, that's the best I can do is talk to my community. And I respected her so much for that because that's what it's going to take. Like, she's like, I don't need to talk to Muslims. I don't need to talk to Black people. I don't need to talk to this person. I I need to talk to my people. And so we had a conversation after she put those stories up because I was like, oh, she really going to get it. Like, they go come for her. She's she's tough. You know, she can handle it, Mm. right? And she's a journalist too. So she, you know, she said, I said, did you get pushback? She said, yeah, I got pushback. She said, and I just pushed harder. Mm -hmm. You push and I push harder. She's like the cognitive dissonance that you have. You don't have to have that. And she's, you know, she's talking about these. She's like, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be as patient as possible with people. But she is literally doing the work. She's doing the work yeah. that needs to be done in order to humanize people. And she said it's a very difficult process. She's like, it's not easy. It's not fun to acknowledge, you know, the things that you've been exposed to in family spaces and community spaces. But it's necessary if you want to live a full life. And I mean, the whole project of the Nation of Islam and like Black Islam, which is like the communal conversion to Islam in the American story, is Mm -hmm. all about that. Like, I'm saying like anybody that would study like what what Black folks went through for Elijah Muhammad to say, don't eat these things anymore. You know what I mean? And don't say these things anymore and don't wear these things anymore. And don't, don't like, you know, there are certain things that we're seeing as so intrinsic to people's identity. And for Muslims to basically say like, no, pork is not part of our culture. For Pork is something that was forced on us. You know what I mean? I mean, that's a, especially to be saying that in 1930, like that's a really radical thing to it's say. It's radical like, to say it in 2023 still. <laughs> man, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But 1930, yeah, yeah it's... It's 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 and and the 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 culture that was created and then I was never in the Nation of Islam, but the Nation of Islam had a huge impact on me converting to Islam Absolutely. because I All saw the way that Islam dignifies a people. Yes, it dignifies this. You I you. I'm I'm a high schooler seeing the fruit of Islam selling final call and offering fresh fruit and making sure, you know, he's greeting us and, you know, telling the brothers, walk on the outside of the sidewalk. Do you know who you're walking with? You're walking with sisters. You have to protect them. Like that does something to a person's psyche. It does. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's it's an incredible thing, and I, you know, and I, I pay attention because of the situation that I have. Like, I pay attention to white people who try to speak a, a, out against white supremacy, and it's easy because there's not a lot of them. But the the most articulate, passionate, focused, natural people, white people that I see speak are Jewish. No doubt about it. There are more mm-hmm. of them. They're more on point. They don't have like there's something very natural where like a lot of times, you know, you notice that like, especially because you know, I'm in spaces com- like where we do this, and you'll see a lot of times white people that are kind of newer to this process, you see like there's a filtering that has to happen. What am I supposed to say? What do I how do I process this? Mm-hmm. What does my training mm-hmm. say? You know what I'm saying? Whereas I think white people who have also, it's like when when a white person experiences being white or being called white, you know what I mean? Which is like science fiction and social reality. Like when, when you've lived in a body that's considered white and you're like eighth generation like that, uh, and then you also have some, some area of life where you have a challenge and maybe you're even impressed in some other way. It like, it either makes you like the most entitled person on your in on earth because you're like I get to be white and I get to be oppressed. I'm special white, you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh, like uh-huh. I'm the whitest of all the white. <laughs> or, or it like does something if it like really lands in your humanity. There's like a thing where you look at like Sim Kern, the writer Sim Kern. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Dog, like Sim is like, man, Sim was this, like Sim's been Sim this whole time. And so when this thing happened, like Sim was immediately on the like, bah, 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 just dropping it, bringing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's deep, man. And so much of what, so much of what I repost are, are Jewish people. You know what I'm saying? And I always write mm-hmm. the grand tradition of Jewish truth tellers. Cause like, man, yep. it's, it's a, it's a profound yep. thing, but those, I mean, those people are going through it in, you know, in their own communities. Yeah. 
They are. They are. And I, I hope they listen to the truth tellers. I hope they listen. I, there's a million things I could talk to you about and ask you about, but I just want to uh, <laughs> to just really, really, you know, thank you and salute you. Uh, you are the you are the creator and the leader of a movement. What you're doing is a fard kifaya. If you weren't doing it, our entire community would be at fault. And I know it's not just you, but also your your growing sorority and army and secret society of healers <laughs> and uh, you know teachers. And uh, I you know I hope that you're able to constantly get your flowers and the support because what you're doing should be an institution that our community should invest deeply in. And anybody that has anything to say, like, you know, Muslims like to really get on the thing about LGBT and all this kind of stuff. And there's a conversation there to be had. Also, that's another group of people that has no problem going directly to speaking for Palestinians, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like, like are some of the most outspoken, Sam Kern again, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, there are certain people that are already un having an, an idea for what it is to not be accepted by society and to know exactly what that looks like, feels like, and mm -hmm. be able to speak from a position of experience, embodied experience about that stuff. But it's like, man... To, if 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 that energy would go to supporting what you're doing and, and what Imam Fahim Shoaib has done over the years and others, to really helping us to heal and to get a sense of the the divinity of of what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a man, what it is to love, what it is to nurture, what it is to be intimate, what it is to to have this kind of like divine gnosis that can happen when things are smooth, and you know, just that, that 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 reality that a person can heal, mm -hmm. that regardless of all of the nightmares that people have been through, it's not going to be overnight, mm -hmm. but a, but it is possible for a, for Allah to heal us. Like Allah can get us right again. Like we can mm -hmm. actually experience the fullness of our of our humanity. So I can talk talk and talk and talk, but I I appreciate you so much. History will record you as one of our great leaders. I think Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad actually lived in, in Phoenix for a little bit. Isn't there a house where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad lived? The Winter Palace. It's a mile yeah. from my office. <laughs> your na your yeah. name will be yeah. in that lineage of, of Claire Muhammad and Betty Shabazz and, yes, you know what I'm saying, and, uh, and all the all the great ones in our community. And um, so I, I just want to say I salute you. I appreciate you. I love you. I'm your student. I'm your brother. Uh, if there's anything, I'll kill everybody for you. Uh, if there's ever anything that, whatever I have is yours. <laughs> and I'm just very, very grateful to you and for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been a fan for a long, 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 long time of you, of the podcast, your music. My kids listen to your music, by the way. Maybe their kids don't, but my, my kids do. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, they love it. They love it. I love it. They love it. 2017 on, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think, that, yes, I think that's where I started them. Yeah. <laughs> They're good. Okay, but thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been this has been um an answer. Do I I was like, ooh, I'd like to be on the Travelers podcast one day. I forgot which episode I was listening to. So thank you so much. Thank you for um just all your kind words and for seeing me and for being you're a part of this space too. Uh I can't I could not do what I do if it were not for my supportive, benevolent um, brothers who just stand up for me. Uh, and, and I count you as one of them. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I hope that this is the first of many conversations, inshallah, that we Yes, have. indeed. Yes, indeed. Much love and special thanks to the village auntie, a.k.a. Sister Angelica. What a just... Well, she's just like a healing person to just even listen to her speak and just to witness her be in the world. Like some people just are healers. Like that's just what God made them to be. So just really grateful to be in conversation with her and community with her in the world with her. Really, really beautiful thing. Um, so make sure to go and follow her on social media at The Village Auntie. Check out the Foundational Womanhood courses and cohorts and secret society and all of that beautiful stuff. Super dope. Brought to you as always by Zakat Foundation, Z-A-K-A-T U-S. Zakat U-S on social media, zakat.org. 
uh, is their website. Go and find something that they do and just put a little something on it. Also, as always, brought to you by BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash travelers. If you want to use that platform to access therapy the way that I do, that's how you do that. Much love and special thanks to everybody that listens to this podcast and gives me feedback all the time. Uh, shout out to the caravan. You know what I'm saying? Those are really beautiful people that uh, support this work. And it really, really means a lot to me. And I genuinely care about all of the people in that group. Uh, yeah. Special thanks to Amna Mirza, Mansur Panawala. Um, much love to DJ Last Word. Uh, to Ant, who did the music for the podcast, to Mark from Medina Hip Hop, who did the logo for the podcast. It's produced by Brendan Kelly, aka BK1, who does everything other than have these conversations. He does it all. So much love to BK1. And he's been doing it with me having this really challenging Wi Fi situation in my office in Istanbul, this place where I record in Istanbul. And we've been having all kinds of technical problems and he keeps on making it happen every week. So much love to my dear friend, my brother, my partner, BK1. And um, we thank you for being here. We'll see you next week, inshallah. We always leave you with the words of peace and paradise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.